Well, um, thank you very much for giving up some of your time to join myself, Hamish Jenkinson, and of course the artist that we're going to bring onto the stage shortly, Rich Simmons. Um, I thought I would begin the process by maybe setting the scene and explaining to you all that I am not a metaverse expert. And quite frankly, anyone that tells you that they are is lying because the metaverse is undefined yet. We're still discovering what the metaverse really means. We are discovering the building blocks of what will become an important part of our lives. I have no doubt of that. But it's very much like that interview that went viral and is still repeated many, many times where Bill Gates is brought on to the nightly news in America and the newscasters laugh at him when he describes what sending an email is. And they think it's a joke. But of course, the joke was on them because we all know that that is the way that we communicate now. And the ideas and topics behind things like NFTs, that wonderful phrase, non-fungible tokens, will play a major role in our lives. And Rich will expand further on that. When thinking about how to start this evening's talk and how to introduce Rich, I thought it was maybe uh, prescient to pick a place to start. And the place I decided to start would be February 2021 um, with an artist called Beeple. So this is an image. Uh, can anyone guess the, the, the name of the image? I'll tell you, it's Zuckerberg. And Beeple was an unknown digital artist that decided to embark on a project. And that project was to create a digital artwork one day, every day, for 5,000 days. And he released those out on his Twitter account. Some were funny, some were serious. Some, like this, make you think. And some were just plain funny. And he continued releasing these projects, gradually building up probably the most important asset when it comes to NFTs, and that is a community. Because people began to see that the ideas behind the artworks that he created were fascinating and funny. And eventually, what he decided to do was combine those digital images that he'd released every day for 5,000 days into one artwork. And then this is what happened. I think it probably means digital art is here to stay. Uh, and I think he's right. Um, that is one end of the scale, <clears throat> but there are others. There are 7 billion people on the planet, and that means that there are a lot of people interested in a lot of things. And it is part of our nature as humans to try and organize, to collect, to rationalize the world that goes around us. Now, someone may have that kind of money but to spend on a digital artwork. Others won't. Others will only have $10 to spend on a digital artwork. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean a lot to them as they go around collecting their digital artworks. Take this guy, for example. I can Brazil! He's, he's just pulled a digital card for a FIFA what? Unlimited game. And he's completely lost his mind. Um, now, where, did, where do these sit in the grand scheme of things? Well, you know, we don't know. Will they be like baseball cards now? Some baseball cards sell for upwards of six million. You know, a 1950s, absolutely perfect baseball card, one of the legendary players, sold recently for six million dollars. Will, will this sell for six million dollars? We don't know. My guess is probably not. But it doesn't matter. He's had a great time, and he'll never forget that moment. And to buy that digital pack, the Panini stickers of my day, cost him you know, a few bucks and gave him an unimaginable amount of joy. There's another guy that's really into this scene. You probably recognize him, Logan Paul. 
He's into something I have Two no cards idea left. about. Oh! We got a Charizard! We got our first Charizard of the day! Oh my god! Kevin Teller, congratulations! We pulled our first, first edition Charizard of the day. I absolutely cannot believe this. That is so cool. Oh, wow. I feel like a three-year-old who has a podcast. So what I'm trying to do is that describe to you guys that there are a lot of people in the planet interested in a lot of things. And I think there's a fair amount of FOMO when it comes to something like NFTs. <clears throat> and I think it's important to distinguish between the underlying technology and the creative project that's going on around it. So we've seen different examples of kind of creative projects. And then there is the underlying technology. And that is fundamentally the blockchain. And the blockchain, I believe, is something that will revolutionize the way that we interact with each other, build community, and build loyalty and value around projects, communities, and shared interests. Moving on to this next example, this is Salvador Mundi. And this is what happened a few years ago. At 315, a shake of the head, no? OK. What would you like? 318? Gentlemen. 400 million. <laughs> so that's Salvador Mundi selling, I think it's Sotheby's, for 400 million. And in a way, why I've shown this clip and why I think it's quite interesting is not only is Leonardo da Vinci an artist that is inspired rich and is seen in his work and tattooed on his body, but what's interesting about this is that there is ambiguity. There are the camp that says this was not painted by Leonardo da Vinci. It was, in fact, painted by someone in his studio and maybe Leonardo put his hand to it. And there are others that say he did paint it, which is why probably someone in Saudi Arabia, maybe even Mohammed bin Salman, paid this eye-watering sum for it. But that all changes with the blockchain, because what the blockchain does is give you absolute knowledge that this artwork belongs to this artist and you are the only owner. What they put into that smart contract about resale rights and future earnings off that artwork is embedded into that smart contract, but it is undeniable that that is the artwork and that you are the owner. And so with that little introduction, I'd like to ask Rich to join me up here on stage. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen. How's it going, guys? So, Rich, this is the, the, the basic process of, um, that you've gone through with your artwork. Um, maybe we can just walk the audience through it, because I think sometimes it feels like a baffling process. But actually, I don't think the actual technology side of things is that baffling. It's much more about building a community around what you're trying to do that is the baffling part. Because if you can't do that, Who's going to be interested in your work? But essentially, when an artist goes about creating an NFT, the, the main thing is to come up with an idea. And that's what you've been brilliant at doing. So you open a crypto wallet. You've got some money. That gives you the ability to mint your digital artworks. You assign each of those artworks their unique digital token. And that means that historical ownership can be tracked across the blockchain unless there's a solar flare and all Wi-Fi's down on all computers. It's listed for sale on the marketplace, and then the buyer buys it. That's, Basically, yeah. That's, yeah. It, it's not as mystifying as many may make it seem. Um, thinking about your work, for you, you always wanted to be an artist, didn't you? Yeah, art was... Um how I saw the world, it's how I communicated. Um, I'm on the spectrum, I have Asperger's, 
didn't get diagnosed until I was 20, so art was just a natural thing for me to communicate those things that I wasn't able to verbalize. So I knew I wanted to do something creative. I grew up wanting to work for Pixar and make films and create characters and tell stories. Um, but as I got older, uh, my interests changed. I discovered street art, I discovered fashion, I discovered art therapy, and I kind of went on my own path and went self-employed at 19, and I've kind of forged my own journey ever since in, in different ways to get to this point now. And tell us, what, what was it like um, back in sort of 2011, Banksy's created an amazing space, one of the few places in London where you could actually create street art without fear of prosecution. He'd done a deal with the mayor of London. There's a safe space. Artists could go down there. How did it feel the first time you were down in Leak Street holding up a stencil? It was, um, so I'd obviously seen a lot of street art before that, walking around London. I remember being on a school trip and sneaking off when everyone was going to a museum and I wanted to see the street art because I found more beauty in how accessible it was on the street, how the textures worked, how the grime and, and the weathering of London actually evolved the artwork and elevated it in some capacity. So I was always inspired by the street art. How can I make art accessible for more people, not just the elitist in a, in a museum kind of format? Um, so to then go to Leak Street with a stencil and spray something, knowing that I'd kind of been inspired by this process, gone home, figured out the techniques, learned it, practiced it, done it at home in my bedroom, to then get on a train to London with spray paint and stencils to do something was um, a very surreal experience, um, but it was baby steps. It was me learning how to be a street artist. And besides a couple of photos of me looking very young and skinny with big hair, um, that's really the only like mark of it. I didn't sign it, I didn't really document it, I didn't post on social media because I wasn't confident enough with the artwork at that point. I had to keep evolving, I had to keep learning how to be an artist, how to be a storyteller, all of the different facets that go into being an artist, I had to learn. Yeah, you were saying to me earlier one of the things that had kind of driven you was WWF, which seems like a fairly odd uh, inspiration pool, yeah. but Apparently not. No, so I, um, I really struggled to communicate uh, when I was younger verbally, which is why I communicated through drawing. But watching wrestling and seeing how they would tell the stories, how they would create promos, how would they create emotion, how they would connect with an audience. And there was a guy called Eric Bischoff who did WCW, which was WWF's rival. And he released a book called Controversy Creates Cash. And I kind of read that and learned about that. And I thought... Banksy's doing the exact same thing. He's using controversial imagery. He's telling stories. He's poking fun at things. And those are the things that are getting in the media. Those are the things that are creating conversation. And learning more about art and art history and people like Warhol that did similar things. I was learning all of the ingredients from, from different mediums, not just from art. You have to have an open mind. So learning how wrestlers would communicate, how they would tell a promo, I learned how to communicate in a similar way. How can I get my ideas across and impassion an audience, impassion people to want to come and see me do something? And as much as I'm never going to be a wrestler, I can take skills from that and apply it into artwork. So I think... Well, we kind of see that here, don't yeah. we? I mean, you've got William and Kate in the background there. Yeah, so uh, it's also important for me to have good people around me personally. I, I created this artwork thinking this could be really funny building up to the royal wedding. And I sent a photoshopped version out to a bunch of people. And uh, there's one person that's in the room today that I sent it to. Everyone said, you can't do that. You can't do that. They'll kill you. It's the royal family. You can't disrespect them. And, and this guy said, you have to paint this. I'm helping. And he flew back from Australia and he came to my studio wow. and I was finishing the stencils and he was calling the media and we did it at a South Bank skate park. So it was free. Everyone could come. I wasn't going to get interrupted because it was private property. We spent a day doing it. And by the end of the day, there was a Japanese TV crew there. There was the BBC. <laughs> it went around the world and it went viral because we did something that created conversation, something that people would talk about. And that's the first time I felt like I had all of the ingredients in play to actually be an artist and move forward with this. So, gee, thank you very much. Nice. Well, you know, working with the media 
uh, has sort of become part, part motif of your work. And I think it was 2014 that the next kind of seminal work uh, hit the streets for the first time. Um, I mean, it sparks a lot immediately just looking at it. And the image that you're seeing here really is a genesis, maybe over a, an eight, nine year period. Yep. Um, <clears throat> But maybe if we could take you back to, to where it all started and, and where the idea came from, Rich. Yeah, so I, after the Will and Kate piece in 2011, I got a gallery in London that gave me the opportunity to do whatever I wanted. They gave me solo shows. So in 2012, 2013, I did two completely different shows that sh showed I could do technical work, emotional work. I could tell stories because I knew I wanted to get to a point with the superheroes. I'd had this in my back pocket for years, but I knew I had to prove myself so when I did it, it was more believable. People... Were, you, were you ever worried that someone might get out there and do it before you? Um, there was an issue with that where another artist did a very similar thing at a very similar window of time, but he did it digitally. I did it on the street. We didn't know each other, but it turns out he's a London guy as well. Um, but I managed to get into the gallery show, um, and I was able to present this idea of using superheroes to talk about everyday things, whether it's sexuality, whether it's um, branding, uh, women's rights with Wonder Woman on the front cover of Playboy. But doing Superman and Batman in, in this iconic pose, you instantly know who they are. Yeah. There's, there's no ambiguity. It's like, why are they like that? You don't have to think, okay, who are these people? I have to get over a couple of hurdles. It's Superman and Batman. Why are they like this? And what I was do you, think, to... do you think Superman and Batman are gay? In some dimensions, they are, yeah. of course. I mean, there's comic books where they are. There's going to be parallel dimensions, if you believe in that kind of thing. The multiverse, we've just seen that with, with all the Marvel world. So, yeah, absolutely. In some of them, who knows what they could be. I think, but, I think for me, what, what's great about this work is, is another thing that you touched on previously, and maybe you can talk a little bit more, which is, um, you know, even, even back then, this is, you know, before equality, diversity is the kind of topic that it rightly should be today. You were alluding to the fact that we should judge people by their actions, not by their sexual preference. Absolutely. I mean, love is love. It doesn't matter who it's with, but I think you should judge them on the fact that they want to be heroes. They want to go out and save people, uh, and that's a positive thing. The fact that they're um, gay in this uh, dimension that I've created shouldn't matter. We should focus on the fact that they're a hero. I mean, if you were trapped in a burning building and a, a hero, a policeman, a fireman, whoever it is was coming to save you, would you deny that help because you found out they were gay? No, you would gladly accept the help because your life's in peril and you would thank them for being a hero. That's what we should do. We should um, judge people on the fact that they're, they're doing good things, they're doing positive things. And the fact they're in love in the background, great. But I want people to focus on, uh, on people being good and positive in the world. And sexuality isn't as important as it is made out to be in the media. I, I work in the commercial sector, so um, I would be terribly worried. I mean, we, we've got some powerful entities behind these uh, two caped superheroes. You've got Warner Brothers owned by AT&T. You've got DC Comics. These are powerful and litigious companies. Were you not yeah. worried that by doing this and then creating prints and selling artworks that you might find yourself in trouble? I mean, there's a gray area in art where you can get away with certain things. I'm not printing it as a comic book. I'm not doing it. I, this image isn't seen in a DC comic book. I haven't ripped it out of a page and claimed it as my own. It's my own composition. I've drawn it. I've told a story with it. I'm not putting it on T-shirts and things like that. So I'm not treading on too many toes. So there's this gray area within fine art that you can do things. But when I did um, the street art, this was a week before Superman versus Batman, the movie came out in 2015. This, this was a, a global street art tour, I think. This was. Right? I did it in London. This is on a wall in Soho. Then I flew to New York, did it there, flew to Los Angeles because I didn't know where it might get picked up but I knew there was an opportunity, and I learned that from Will and I Kate. I think you had a strong indication or idea that it might I, get picked I'd up. I learned my lessons, and I, I knew how to apply those, uh, those things that I'd learned with Will and Kate into this piece. But once this got picked up and it did go viral, I did get an email from Warner Brothers, from the head of the movie division, 
and I thought I was getting sued. This is the first time I thought I've overstepped the mark here. And it turns out he loved it, he bought the piece, and he invited me to a red carpet DC movie event where I met Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck, and I got to introduce them to the work, and they both loved it. So because of this piece uh, and having the bravery to go out and do it um, in the way that I did it, I was able to actually meet Superman and Batman, and they loved it. The only thing that Ben Affleck said was, um, uh, don't create, recreate it with me when we take a picture together. <laughs> um, which is a shame. That's a good line. Because he's a big man. Um, <laughs> big handsome man. Big handsome man. He is built like a tank. He did look like Batman. Um, it was a very surreal experience meeting them both. But that's what art can do. It can open up doors and it can change people's lives. And this piece has not just changed my life, but I've seen other people that have ended up wearing Batman and Superman cufflinks at their wedding. They've had Batman and Superman action figures recreating this on top of their wedding cake. Love it. Um, so this piece of artwork isn't just changing my life. It's also changing the lives of people around the world. It's in, empowering them to realize that they can be heroic. They can uh, open up. They can be heroes within their own communities. So that's the power of artwork. And uh, it's been exciting to see the journey of it. Oh, brilliant. Um so sort of moving on from Batman and Superman, that, that kind of motif of storytelling has developed into this kind of new series. Maybe you can allude to what's inspired you here. Yeah, so when I was younger and I, I did the gallery shows, um, I would go to the galleries and I would work there. I, would, I just wanted to be part of it. So I would sit in there, but people coming to the gallery didn't realize I was the artist. I didn't really have much social media presence back then. They thought I was just the stock boy that would wrap the paintings up. So I got to watch people reacting to my artwork, and that was sometimes more powerful for me than the actual artwork on the wall. I got to see how they would respond to it because a good piece of artwork should evoke emotion. So when someone goes to a gallery and they say, ah, that's nice, next, ah, that's nice, next, that's not a successful piece of artwork. It's when people will come and they'll stop in front of something and they go, okay, what's going on here? And they have to think a bit and they have to change their perspective on the world. They have to have a conversation. They have to be emotionally connected to it that successful artwork to me. So by tapping into that and exploring this idea of storytelling, taking Superman and Batman, how would people react to that? How would the story evolve? So doing The Girl with the Glasses, the first reflections piece, she's seeing it from across the street. Is this Lois Lane? Is it a random person on the street? Is it one of their girlfriends? Is it a fan of them as a hero? How would she react to seeing them? Other people will then put themselves in her position and think, well, how would I react? whether it's Superman and Batman or a loved one that I know that's going through something. So it was a very powerful idea of kind of channeling this emotion. And that got more response than the actual Superman and Batman piece. More really? people responded to reflections. So I knew that I was onto this idea of storytelling. How can I evolve and move it forward? And um, reflections has kind of stuck with me as this seminal moment, this capturing a a pivotal moment I mean, in someone's we, we can really see in your work these kind of um, uh, pop art inspirations, Roy Lichtenstein. Who are the people that you draw mostly from? Because it, it, there are versions of this where we see the Mona Lisa reflected in the, in the glasses. I know yeah. Leonardo da Vinci's someone that you yeah been inspired anyone, that's, by. Uh, anyone that knows me and has followed me on social media knows that I'm a a massive Da Vinci fan. I have him tattooed on me. I've got to go behind the scenes at the British Museum and hold his work. Um, I love art history as well. I love um, the comic book artists from the early days, Jack Kirby and people like that. Stan Lee is another one of my heroes with the storytelling, creating characters. How can he create worlds within worlds? Uh, so all of these different things have inspired me um, to be able to create a style mm. that draws on the old school comic books, pop art, how, um, how can I tell stories using street art techniques, uh, using graphic design and engineering? So it ticks all of my different boxes of all these different eras where there is Fibonacci built into this. Really? I was going to say, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at a, a golden ratio. This is mm -hmm. um, the proportions that have, we see in nature. So you see them in the vortex of a storm in the unfurling of a fern. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure whether that does play into the design yeah. of your pieces. But, yeah, but I'm a massive nerd. So when I'm creating a piece, I want to make sure it's compositionally as good as I can make it. So there is mathematics, there is science, there is engineering before it even gets turned into a painting. I want to know that 
this is going to look good on the eye. Uh, and lessons that I've learned from the Renaissance, from the Da Vinci's of the world, have played into that, learning about color and, and how comic books are produced from people like Jack Kirby, from Wall, from Lichtenstein over the years. All of these different things have fed into a style where I'm satisfied that I get to appreciate and pay my respects in lots of different ways. And it's, it's not boring. I get to do design. I get to do the engineering. I get to do the immediacy of spray paint. I get to tell stories. So every different part of the process is different. And I get that satisfaction of knowing that every day is going to be different for me. It's funny. I, I, when I think about kind of contemporary art, and, and Warhol's a good example about, of this, is, you know, uh, when, you, when you've created a kind of iconic image, there is a temptation to just recreate that image again and again and again in various different ways. And you become recognizable. The artwork builds up value. Um, well, I've forgotten his name now, but um, the book cover guy, uh, the Penguin Books, yep. you know, he, all Harlan he does... Miller. What? Harlan Miller? Yeah, Harlan Miller, exactly. Harlan Miller's, you know, he's found his trope, mm -hmm. and that's what he does now. And he's trapped in that trope. His work's brilliant. I love it. I wish I'd, I wish I'd bought one years ago. Um, you still continue to push the boundaries, though, and, and continue that storytelling journey. I get bored very easily. And I, I have so many ideas. This is one of the, um, the side effects of the Asperger's is that my brain is going 100 miles an hour all the time with lots of different ideas. And I want to write books and I want to develop technology and I want to tell this story and that story and, and touch on that topic. So as much as I've found a style that works for me where you can tell it's my work, I'm able to tell different stories and play on things and start to connect the dots between different universes. So... The reflections has evolved into well other pieces, but a, a very successful recent New York show, right? Yeah, just got back from New York, had another solo show at Tagli Latella Galleries, um, combining Superman and Batman and the Between the Capes uh, series, introducing the next NFT that will be coming, introducing people to the reflections paintings, uh, and the exhibition itself. We invited people from both the NFT world and the physical gallery world. Physical what was that like? It was amazing because my whole purpose of coming into NFTs was how can I take all of this experience I have with gallery shows and art collectors and all of this excitement around technology and NFTs, how can I bring these two worlds together? Because they seemed very separate. You have this crowd over here that likes crypto and digital and you have a crowd over here that's, if it's not been touched by the artist, I don't want to see it. But you have the ability to bring those two worlds together and there's other artists like Cause that is bringing augmented reality into exhibitions. Mm -hmm. There's other artists like Damien Hirst that is introducing this idea of, would you rather have the digital or the physical? So these worlds are colliding, and I felt like I could be one of those people that could bring it slightly closer. Again, in my own fashion, I can shape the industry. It's so malleable at the moment that I can leave an imprint on that and be one of the pioneers of it. So bringing in people that have never been to a gallery show, they've never seen a painting, to then people seeing the digital versions of it on the wall and, and animations of the painting and getting them to have conversations and seeing both sides of the fence was incredibly interesting. Brilliant. Um, again, sort of thinking back to scale here, maybe you could just walk us through what we're seeing. And, and I'll just point it out that there's Rich, <laughs> that tiny little thing there. Yeah. So we're talking epic. <laughs> yeah, so this piece, um, The Reflections, I did it for the first time with the Mona Lisa in 2016, I believe. So it went from being Superman and Batman, and I tried different iterations of it with different galleries, some of them saying, we sell Chanel things. It would look great with a Chanel bottle in the glasses and, and a girl pining over Chanel, or can we have the Statue of Liberty because a girl is going to America and she's, she's lost with this whole political issue going on. She needs to find hope. So I tried it with different things, and then I was getting frustrated with the galleries. I wanted to make work that I wanted to make. And being a massive fan of Da Vinci, I wanted to relive that experience of seeing the Mona Lisa for the first time. Um, so I put the Mona Lisa in the glasses, created a brand new girl. And that piece almost opened up a brand new world for, mm. for people that were art history fans that remember going to a gallery, remember seeing a piece of street art for the first time. And it takes them back to that moment. They get to relive it. I think the thing I love about well, the Mona Lisa and Leonardo da Vinci, we think of him as this unbelievable artist. Uh, how many paintings did he paint? 
six. That's no. it. No, it's more than six. It's, it's about six. There's loads of drawings. <laughs> there's, there's loads of drawings. There's loads of sketches. Yeah. But actual paintings that are attributed to him. It's closer to a dozen. There's other finished ones not, as well. I, I'm, ca I'm counting finished ones, let's okay. say. It's, it's, not a, it's not a large volume of paintings. No, it's a very small volume compared to other artists. Um, because he was so interested in so many other things. I mean, he was the first, to me, Da Vinci was the first superhero. The fact that he was able to create incredible works, invent things, but also with the engineering, with anatomy, with mathematics and science. The Vitruvian Man, which everyone knows the, the pose, is based on a mathematical problem. It's how do you calculate the volume of a circle compared to a square? And he was trying to solve that and he created the piece of artwork around it. So the fact that he was able to do such a body of work in so many different fields is hugely inspiring to me. He's the original superhero. I want to kind of take a tiny fraction of that and play with artwork, storytelling, engineering, technology in my own way. I know I'm never going to be a Da Vinci, but I can be myself and tap into all of these different facets that I enjoy. So doing the Mona Lisa was me celebrating Da Vinci and all of the things that he represented and it's gone on, it's been canvases, it's been a giant piece of street art. This is a four story building in Arkansas in America. So I flew out for my first museum show with Superman and Batman in the gallery show, um, which I got to experience my work as a living artist in a museum, which at 33 I think I was at the time, blows my mind that I had two works in a museum. And while I was there, it was the 500th anniversary of the death of Da Vinci that year. Oh, wow. So I painted this a month before that, and then on the day of the anniversary, I got him tattooed on me. So it was a very Brilliant. Da Vinci year. Well, may maybe someone online can like do the research, and at the yeah. end, they can update us with the uh, whatever Google says, and we'll take that as fact. Okay. How, many, how many did he paint? So Reflections is your um, motif for leaping into NFTs. So mm -hmm. before we go into your first collection. Maybe talk to me about where you'd started to hear this wonderful term, non-fungible token. So I don't know if anyone is aware, but we were in a pandemic over the last yeah. few years. We were in lockdown. And um, the way that the art market works is in March, everyone kind of wakes up. Galleries start contacting you because everyone's over the January blues, Christmas, they get their bonuses in the financial industry a lot of the time in February. So everyone starts saying, all right, what pieces do I want to buy this year? Where can I put my money? What kind of opportunities are there? So like clockwork, first week of March, I got offered multiple gallery shows, multiple opportunities for other things. And I thought, right, that's my year planned out. And two weeks later, we were all in lockdown Gone. and I lost all of it. Yeah, terrifying. I, yeah, um, but it gave me an opportunity for the first time in maybe 10 years to have a breather and to explore new ideas, new technologies, new ways of creating artwork, new ways to tell stories. So I kind of changed my studio up. I built spin painting machines out of electric fans just because I wanted to try spin painting. I didn't know what machine Damien Hurst used, so <laughs> took an electric fan, sliced it up, and made a spin painting machine. Uh, I got to experiment with prints uh, and new technologies, things like foil printing with holographic and gold and shiny things introducing a new price point to my market because not everyone can afford a 300 pound silk screen. Not everyone can buy a, a 3000 pound painting, but there's a lot of young people that follow me on social media that might want a hundred pound print that's affordable. That will introduce them, become a collector. So doing holographic things led into, well, that looks really, really cool as a print. How the hell do I recreate that as a, as a canvas? How do I get holographic canvases? So it allowed me to explore new, new technologies, new ways to create color, new ways to create experiences. And during that process of exploration and discovery and, and just testing out new ideas, uh, I was introduced to NFTs and realized very quickly, this is very much like a stencil. This is, okay, it's configurable. This is how it's made to create 10,000 of this thing. It's a background layer right. and then a base layer and then a monkey wearing a hat or smoking a cigar or whatever the hell the, the ugly monkey is doing. Okay, I get it. It's very similar with stencils. You create the skin tone and then the lips and then the hair and then you build up those layers so each one lines up and at the end of it, black layer goes on, you have a painting. Okay, well, I have that in Photoshop already. I have an NFT already in Photoshop. But which is the right piece to do? What's the right market? Where's it going? 
and I really wanted to come into this uh, industry and make a mark as being an artist because I didn't feel there was enough legitimate artwork in the space. There was a lot of crap. And no offense to a lot of the artists out there, I didn't consider a lot of NFT art art, which is why so many people were put off by it. I saw that as an opportunity to come in and educate this entirely new audience about the importance of art, the artists that came before, and I could celebrate them through this piece. And whereas before this was a stencil, so you, you cut the Mona Lisa into the stencil, I can't change that. Photoshop, I can just cut the Mona Lisa out and drag a Warhol piece in. I can drag a Banksy piece in. All of a sudden, it completely changes the dynamic of the piece. I'm now celebrating street art. I'm now celebrating the Renaissance. I'm now celebrating pop art and all these different facets that I love. But then I can change the hair and I can add holographic and I can add gold and I can add all these different things that instead of maybe doing 10 canvases out of one stencil before the stencil's trashed, now I can do 10,000 of them if I want to using this technology. So it completely opened up my mind to an entirely new way of, of creating. But I wanted to do a piece that actually made sense. So talking of making sense, in a way, it strikes me that there are two parts to the NFT. Um, and I've talked a lot about community. And I think you've been very cognizant to the fact that you're where you are today because of uh, the people that have flown across the world to support your early works, the collectors that have followed your progress, and the community that you've built up. Mm -hmm. So you knew you had that community. And then there was the other side of this, which is the blockchain and the smart contract. What happens to the money? How does the money become distributed? Talk us through the process of thinking about that minting and what that smart contract was going to do and where the money was going to go and how it was going to be deployed. Because Absolutely. I think that was maybe a big part of the success of the yeah, reflections. So before I'd even had a gallery show, um, I was running an art therapy project called Art as the Cure. So I was going into schools, I was running workshops, I was trying to promote mental health and how creativity and art could help. It helped me, it saved my life. Art genuinely saved my life and I wanted to be able to share that message with as many people as possible. So I'd already built a community around Art as the Cure of people that also shared this passion for art therapy. And while I was doing that on this parallel track, I was going off and I was becoming an artist and I was funding these workshops and funding these opportunities by selling paintings. So now that this opportunity with NFTs comes in and there's a, a lot more scope for making a larger sum of money straight away, how can I leave a big impact? How can I create physical collectors out of people that have never had a painting before? How can I introduce the idea of one of one prints that I wasn't doing before? Silk screens is usually okay, we have to make a minimum of 50 of it to make it make mm -hmm. sense. So how can I not only inspire people, create art collectors, but also give back and have conversations about art, art history, mental health? That was a big thing that I wanted to succeed in. So when we launched it, I said that we would give away $100,000 worth of artwork to people that had collected the NFT. A lot of them have never had a piece of artwork in their life. But now, because they believed in the project, because they bought an NFT, they stood a chance. And 10 people around the world now have a reflections canvas hanging in their home worth $10,000, probably more in the future. Um, 35 people got a Gicle print. Um, but it was the conversations I was able to have about mental health, going into Twitter spaces, having an audience on there to talk about how art had saved my life, promote art therapy, and then find ways to give back um, by donating to mental health organizations, by raising awareness for this, by partnering up with other artists that also want to give back um, in different ways, and realizing we have a responsibility as artists. The more of an audience we have, the more responsibility we have to try and do good for that audience, to try and inspire them, because you never know what someone's going mm -hmm. through. So if I can have an impact in some capacity, if someone can listen to me talk and say, well, I also struggled with something, and..." I didn't realize that writing poetry was my version of art as the cure. That's amazing. Now I'm going to focus on that. And I've had stories all over the world from thousands of people for 14 years now since I started this, that art has changed their life. And it's that catalyst of realizing that you can take someone's pain and you can take someone's creativity. And if you combine them, you can change someone's life. And people have had their lives changed all over the world because of this. Yeah, it's brilliant. And in terms of the kind of technical process, how did you find that? So 
you're competent in what you want to produce as an artist, and now you've got to navigate your way. Um, probably there's platforms that we know, uh, Super Rare, OpenSea. What, what was the process of kind of engaging with those marketplaces, working out which would be the best for you? Can I mean, you maybe tell, tell the audience a little bit about that? Yeah, so I knew that I didn't know the technology of how to build a Web3 website, how to integrate smart contracts, how to do all of that. So it's very much a team effort. And I found a team of people that were able to facilitate the launch of this. They were able to help me build a Web3 website that would integrate smart contracts, that would integrate um, MetaMask wallets, so someone could connect their wallet to the site to be able to purchase something with crypto. Once they've purchased it, it would then show up on OpenSea, so the collection then migrates to OpenSea for the secondary market. So it was really a case of, I want my marketplace to look like this. People will come on my website, they will buy it. They will then be able to resell it and showcase it in their OpenSea. Um, and this is a virtual gallery that I built, kind of showcasing some of the color options. I was able to explore skin tones, different paintings in the lenses, rarity elements like holographic and, uh, and gold and have fun with it. But I wanted, to, I wanted to make people appreciate the artwork in different ways, be able to digest it in different ways and consume it however they wanted to. I've kind of been around the art world for, for, for quite a long time, and it's, it's quite a murky business. Um, galleries don't disclose prices. Certain dealers will go into auction houses. They'll raise their hand on an artist that they know and like and probably have a lot of their artwork hidden under the bed. It's a murky, hidden world until it becomes public at the big auction, house, auction houses. Did you feel a certain amount of pressure going into that first NFT collection? Um, because no. it is so public and money seems to be such a big part of NFTs and trading. No, it was a weight off my shoulders. The fact that it was transparent, the fact that I was in control, the fact that I got the creative director. I didn't have to deal with galleries. I didn't have to have someone telling me what to make. I was in charge. I got to produce the work that I was happy with. I got to tell the stories that I wanted. Um, it was the first time that I felt in complete control. There was no gallery behind so would, me. So would you say that's kind of fundamentally changed the, your relationship with your fans? A hundred percent. It's completely flipped the art market for me. With galleries, a lot of the time, I don't know who buys the painting. So for me... They, the gallery doesn't... They don't want... No. Rich to know who's bought the painting. They guard that closely yeah. and secretively. And I think when I was talking and introducing this, I think that's really the fundamental kind of point that NFTs are changing is that the relationship moves from being uh, the, the art dealer, the auction house, to being a direct relationship. Um, and you use your Discord channel as well, don't you? Yeah, I mean... Just going back to the previous point, being an artist is a very, very lonely existence. A lot of the time, it's me in a studio for months on end, not seeing anyone, cutting stencils and painting, doing one gallery show where for everyone, it's a brand new experience. They're seeing the art for the first time. For me, it's a goodbye to the artwork because I might never see it again. And I don't know who the collectors are and I don't have relationships with them. And with NFTs, I'm encouraged to know who they are. I'm encouraged to build a community. I'm encouraged to embrace the people that buy that and get to know them because they will then collect more NFTs, more artwork in the future. And I formed friendships in the last few months on the back of this by being able to have these conversations that I was never able to have from a decade of gallery shows. So for me personally, it's completely flipped my experience as an artist. It doesn't feel as lonely. It feels inclusive. We're able to build a community in our own image. I get to call it Art as the Cure. I get to have conversations about mental health. I get to talk to people about Da Vinci mm. and things like that. Things that I nerd out about and now the things that people actually want to come and listen to. And before, the gallery was saying, no, we don't want you to do that because then what's the point of having a gallery? Yeah. You just go and do it yourself. Now I feel like I'm in the position where I can do it myself. I can form something in my own image and I control the wheels. I, it's my hands on the steering wheel and I'm... I'm the happiest I've ever been, and this is one of the reasons for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny. I, Gary V. I don't know if people know, he's one of these, like, NFT sensations. He's got a absolutely awful, if you ask me, NFT collection, V Friends, with, like, giant blubber whales and things like that. But he does say some interesting things about NFTs, and I do genuinely believe that underlying what he's saying is 
you know, collectively, community plays such an incredible role. We take Rich, you know, he wants to do a huge artwork, bigger than the one we saw in Austin, I think it was. Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas. Bigger than the one he did in Arkansas, but it's going to cost a lot of money. He's going to need a cherry picker. He's going to need a team of uh, 50 people to do it. He wants it to be permanent. He wants it to last. The paint alone is going to cost £30,000 just to cover the wall. And he can't do it. But what he can do is reach out to his community and say, guys, I need you all to buy one of these and you'll own an NFT. I'm only going to make 5,000 of them and they're only going to cost this much money. And if you buy them, I get to make this artwork in the real world. And the community comes together and says, yes, you can, Rich. He's got the money, he paints the painting, and they own the NFT. And that potentially, that's the art world, but that's right across the creative spectrum. So a great movie director, we've got one in the room actually, Sam, he's got an idea for a movie, he wants to make the movie, he doesn't have the funding. He, all right, he's won a BAFTA award, for, well, nominated for a BAFTA award, but you know, he can't break through the studio system. Maybe he can sell those little storyboards that him and his mates have been pencil sketching as NFTs and say, you own back end of that movie. Raise me a million quid and I'll make it. And now you, you own a piece of that movie and that movie gets made. Maybe it's a flop, maybe it's not. But that's what these kind of smart contracts are really alluding to. And for me, that's an incredibly exciting place to be. I mean, talking about the future, Mm -hmm. We've got a little glimpse into what might be coming next, right? Yeah, this is a little teaser. Um, so, obviously, Reflections was the first collection. I felt that was the most important one to start with because I was coming in to a new industry about art where a lot of people don't know about art, which was very surreal. But I felt like it was the right piece for me to step my toe into, into this world, educate people about art, and, and bring something in that was still iconic enough in itself. It was a very popular piece, and it meant a lot to me. But Superman and Batman is its own world in itself. This has been the piece that I've done the most storytelling around, where I've evolved the story in so many different ways. And whereas Reflections was one image of a girl and I could switch out the color of her skin and her hair and her nails and the painting and the lenses, now it's basically going to be about 10 collections in one. It's multiple scenes, multiple people experiencing the news, the image in different ways. Um, across the multiverse where they're in different outfits with different people wearing different color dresses and hairs and different times of day and I can explore all these different elements and rarity scores and everything else within it tell lots of different stories within one collection and that's me pushing the limit of what I can do as an artist how I can be a storyteller how I can showcase all of these different ideas and give people more choice they might want the front cover of the Daily Planet they might want the Guardian they might want the LA Times so they're going to go out and collect the one that suits them the most. It might be a blonde girl that lives in L.A. She'll try and find the Los Angeles Times with blonde hair with them on the front cover. Well, I want to give the audience a little chance to ask any questions, but maybe if you could kind of um, send a message to those that are thinking about doing something in the NFT space, what are the, what are the sort of three most important things for you to um, crack? Good artwork, because at the end of the day, good artwork will always rise to the top, and you're trying to create something that people can enjoy visually. Whether they display it on the wall as a print, as a digital image, whether they have it on their phone, on their profile picture, it still needs to look good. It still needs to excite them. Um, having something with integrity, where the artist can show that by investing in me and investing in this piece, I'm able to go out and do something amazing on the back of this, and you can follow my journey. Um, and being able to build that community around that, being able to give back, interact, showcase, bring them along on the journey and excite them, these are all exciting things that NFTs are allowing us to do and more artists should embrace in different ways. Great. Well, thanks for that. It was brilliant. Um, I'd just love to maybe uh, throw it out to you guys and see if you've got any questions for Rich. You were saying earlier that he really just at the start of all of this and... Um, I think there's a danger sometimes that the more you look into it, the whole NFT, metaverse, blockchain, you can get really confused. It's really refreshing to hear your story from traditional art into the NFT world. Do you think people are jumping ahead of themselves a bit with NFTs and blockchain and Web3? 
I think art is what people have been exposed to first with this, but the mm. blockchain is going to go way beyond just NFTs. The blockchain is going to add security to everything. You're going to buy a car, it's going to come with an NFT proving that you own that car. Things like that. Um, so the way that people introduce this into other technologies, that's when people are going to really get it. Artists are usually the first ones to pick up on a new idea, a new area. They, the artists move in to a crappy area, they do it up, they paint it, that area ends up becoming valuable. It's a very similar thing with this, where the artists have seen the opportunity, they've embraced it, they've jumped on it, more and more people are seeing it as more than just artwork, it's now an investment. But the technology behind it, the blockchain, is going to revolutionize so many different industries, and that's when people are going to go, oh, that's why NFTs were important. I think it's still a little bit early. There's still going to be several years of developing it where people understand the importance of this. Um, but we are very, very early within this technology taking over. Web3 is, is very similar to the start of the internet back in the day when people didn't quite know where this was going to go. And blockchain and Web3 is, is very similar. It's, we don't know where it's going to go. We're still shaping the industry. But everyone will get it in a few years' time, and it will become second nature. Rich, um, how do you feel about uh, collaborating with other artists? Oh, Especially artists are the worst. Don't collaborate. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. Um, the really exciting thing about NFTs is that, especially coming from the gallery model, where only certain kinds of artists and certain kinds of artwork works in a gallery setting, it can be very elitist, it can be very uh, secluding. There's so many different kinds of creativity uh, and different kinds of creative people that can embrace this technology. Look at Beeple, he was a digital artist. Had he ever had a gallery show before he sold a $50 million um, NFT or whatever the value was in the end? Probably not, but he's embraced this technology and he's now a legitimate artist on the back of it. 3D animators, people that make animations and sculptures and comic book artists and storytellers and musicians and videographers, all of these people. An NFT is essentially a digital asset. It's someone's creative outlet that they can make money from. They can have a, an income from selling something, a secondary income from uh, the royalties on the back of that, um, and they can grow a career within this space. And it's allowing more people an opportunity to have a career as an artist. Um, so it's incredibly exciting to see the entire creative industry open up. The ability to collaborate and say, okay, well, I do this kind of street art style, but you're a 3D animator. Can we make a, a, a cartoon, an animation of my artwork, but can you make her actually move? Can you make a 3D model of it where it actually looks like a real woman lifting off real 3D sunglasses? That would be incredibly exciting to see. So the potential is massive. It's hugely exciting, and uh, again, we're so early on on this that I haven't even scratched the surface with collaborations, but the fact that it's not just going to be me in a studio cutting stencils, it's going to be me sitting down with other people, getting inspired by how they work, seeing other opportunities, and going, well, wait a minute, I could take that thing that you're doing and that thing that I'm doing, and we could invent entirely new things. That's what collaborations do, and that's where this industry is going gonna, is gonna to lead, and the creative world uh, has been stagnant, I think, for a little while. It's all going to change moving forward. It's the most exciting time to be an artist, I think, in 50 years, probably. So collaborations with the right artist. Most artists are weird. Um, I've got a kind of follow-on question from that. Firstly, I, was, I flippantly accepted this invite to come without really checking out what was going on. And then I saw the image, it's like, holy sh oh, right, and now I've connected the dots, I came in late. It's like, oh my God, it's the guy that did that. So I missed the beginning of the story, but um, firstly, this is there wicked. This is I'm like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Time travel. Um, <laughs> you so, missed the hell of a story. <laughs> my question <laughs> was... <Hamish> teleported in. <laughs> I came in from a pole. Wild. I was, um, I was wondering, like, in terms of like, sort of collaboration and that type of thing, your approach, you see like, you know, lots of big brands out there. Your view or potential view to sort of collaborating with brands, not at a let's make a burger or a pair of trainers bullshit kind of level, PR level, but actually at a, so compelling how you've positioned NFTs from the artist. What your, at, what your sort of approach might be, would you consider working with a brand in terms of the storytelling, the narrative, the journey, 
and the education piece of it, not even actually making an NFT, but mm. sharing what you've just shared, because it, yeah. it's really fresh, like from what I've heard so far around this subject. Yeah, I mean, my, my whole perspective with art is how can I push limits? How can I take stencils to the next level? How can I take NFTs to the next level? How can I create collaborations that have never been thought of before, not just slapping it on a T-shirt and saying, right, we're done? So it's, it's more and more brands are learning about this technology. I was just over in New York for NYC NFT, and there was car companies, there was fashion houses, all trying to learn about the possibilities of integrating uh, not just NFTs, but augmented reality and, and things like that. And I'm seeing amazing artists, one of them here, uh, Chroma Kane, doing crazy things where she's taken NFTs and she's exploring fashion and how can she do things like that? Other fashion industries will, will tap into that and go, well, wait a minute. We could have a catwalk full of people in the future wearing a black cat suit, and people have to watch the show through their phone to see the actual designs being worn. Like Those kind of collaborations are going to come as the technology evolves as well, as more creatives realize the potential of, of what could come. So we're right at the start of it, and I would love more people to think outside the box. And I think that's what it's going to take is is companies going, well, yeah, we've got a car, and we could give him a spray can, and he can paint it. Or we could take a 3D model of a car, and he could animate all of the panels on it with a moving artwork and stick it in a video game that people can do something with. I, I don't know. It's, um, as I said, it's incredibly exciting. The industry is incredi incredibly malleable right now, and the right people that are willing to put themselves out there, think outside the box, are going to shape that. Brilliant. Right. Well, I think on that note, we'll end it there. Uh, if I could ask you to put your hands together for Rich. Thank you so much for giving your time up. Great job, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much, man.